There's an old saying in the video games industry that goes a little something like this. Good artwork doesn't necessarily mean you've got a good game on your hands. Hello everybody, this is Sutek94, and I'm here to tell you that this statement can extend to the world of trading card games. Now, I guarantee that some of you have been looking at these boxes and booster packs and are saying, Oh man, I remember this game and I think it's bad. I'm just going to get that out of the way to start off with. Welcome to the world of Hyborian Gates. You might not enjoy the stay, but you will enjoy the artwork. I don't have much info in terms of who actually made this, outside of the producer being labeled as Hall Publications Incorporated, but the original idea seems to have evolved from the Conan the Barbarian mythos, the Hyborian Age referring to a time period within that mythos, the term Hyborian itself derived from Hyberborea, who, in Greek mythology, were giants who lived possibly in and around the North Pole. The game itself has reflections of this, and it wouldn't surprise me to see this being a full-fledged Conan CCG early in development. Whatever the case might be, Hyborian Gates was the end result, released in 1995 by a publisher calling themselves Cards. As far as TCGs are concerned, this was Cards' only entry into that market. They did publish other trading cards, like the world-famous San Diego Zoo, Animals of the Wild, and yes, William Shatner's Tech World, based off the comic book of the same name, in turn based off of William Shatner's Tech War. With regards to expansion sets, none seem to exist. As you'll find out in due time, I think that's actually kinda sad. Hyborian Gates was distributed in starter decks, 15 card boosters, starter boxes with 12 decks per box, and booster boxes with 36 boosters. The boosters contain 13 normal cards, a gate card, and a pyramid card. The starter decks contain 55 cards and were normally distributed in kits that contain two decks, 12 pyramid cards, a book to obtaining a degree in understanding Hyborian Gates, also known as this game's rulebook, cards representing the game's six dimensions, and a registration card to get a trooper kit, which includes an exclusive card, a newsletter, and more. Card rarity includes commons, uncommons, rares, and ultra rares. By doing a quick count of a checklist I found online, there are around 450 unique cards in this game. There are even a few promo cards, including the ancient gate card, found only in booster packs. You could exchange it for a limited edition print by the game's main artists, Boris Vallejo and his wife, Julie Bell. About that Vallejo and Bell artwork, part of me wants to believe that this game was created to sell this artwork. It is good art, to be fair, rivaling, arguably surpassing even Magic's artwork at that time. In fact, this game's presentation as a whole is pretty darn good. The artwork, the look and feel of the cards themselves, no yeah, these cards actually feel really well made to me. But back to the artwork for a bit. On the surface, you'd expect Hyborian Gaze to have big time sword and sorcery themes considering its origins and artists. Of course, that means a lot of butts, boobs, and muscular dudes. In before demonetized. What if I told you that this game also had starships? Guys who look like the bastard child of the Cobra Commander and Boba Fett, robot spider things, the Silver Surfer, the most 80s looking fellow you've ever seen who by the way is literally named just a man, and people who I swear live down the street from me. Yeah, the artwork is all over the place here thematically and further backs up my claim that this game was made to sell artwork. You see the words, featuring illustrations by Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, all over the packaging, and I'm pretty sure the art is recycled from other places. By that, I mean most of this artwork wasn't made specifically for this game. The cards themselves are 75-80% to 80 composed of this artwork, and the layout suffers from Super Deck Syndrome. That is, the name and rules text of the card is toward the middle or bottom, more bottom in this case. Set Syndrome is worse here because of how the game works. Yep, I'm getting to that now. Remember when I said that you would need a degree just to understand how to play this game? I say that because the gameplay and rules are complicated. Pretty darn complicated. To start off, let's look at the things on these cards that aren't the artwork. 
On the top left is a symbol indicating the card's type, be it a trooper, a monster, a companion, a tech, a vehicle, holy crap, it's Kaladesh, a magic, a vortex tactic, or a power surge. The troopers, monsters, companions, and vehicles have numbers within these symbols indicating their attack number or modifier on top and their defense below that. Top right is another symbol indicating the dimension this card belongs to. There are six dimensions in total, Hyboria, Gaia, Asgard, Atlantis, Osiris, and Chaos. Wait, the Chaos Dimension? Is Discord gonna show up on one of these cards? Well, anyways, the main objective of the game is to capture as many dimensions as possible. The number of dimensions you can capture is limited by how many players there are in the game. If you have two players, the goal is five dimensions. For three players, it's four dimensions, and for four or more players, it's three. The dimensions themselves are represented by these cards I mentioned earlier, and yes, the dimensions have to be in this order. The rulebook states that the dimensions are, and I quote, linked in a circle. Now, are you still with me? I feel like this is about to get more and more complicated. Let's talk about card types for a moment because eight different card types were more than enough for these people. I'm going to start with troopers. Troopers are the commanders of your forces, and their attack and defense numbers can be augmented by playing things like companion cards on them. Oh no, this game really is starting to turn into super deck. Well, anyways, monsters, from what I can tell, are exactly the same thing as troopers. They can also have things like companions played on them. Companion cards can only be played with troopers and monsters from the same dimension, unless its text states otherwise. There is no limit to the number of companions that can be played on a trooper or monster. Tech cards are equipment, items and weapons for your troopers. These cards give your troopers a special ability, and some of these modify your troopers' attack and defense. By the way, is that Moses with the Ten Commandments? Anyways, all tech comes from the Osiren dimension, though they can be played on any trooper from any dimension, it looks like. For each tech played on an Osiren trooper, however, they get plus one strength for each attached card. In this game, strength refers to a number that modifies both attack and defense. Vehicles only come from Asgard and can only be operated by Asgardian troopers as well as other troopers which have been granted the ability to use them. Any trooper can only operate one vehicle unless stated otherwise. Some cards have more than one symbol on the top right, which indicates that these need more than one transportation points. Now, what is a transportation point? Um, it's a thing that exists? I guess it has something to do with pyramid complexes and how many pyramids are currently on a gate? I'm not gonna lie, this really confused me at first, and it wouldn't be the only thing about this game that did that to me. Far from it, actually. Magic cards only come from Gaia and can only be used by Gaian troopers, as well as other troopers which have been granted the ability to use them. Gaian troopers can only use magic whilst in combat in a dimension, or whilst in an adjacent dimension, and not in combat. And they can only use one magic per battle, and the power, duration, and effect of this magic varies by card. These are usually discarded after a battle ends, unless stated otherwise. Vortex Tactics cards are played at the very beginning of a battle, and only during battles. Their effects only apply to troopers in one specific battle. After a player sends any troopers, monsters, and any attached cards to attack a target, they can play any number of these cards face down. The defender plays any number of these face up, and the defender's Vortex Tactics are resolved before the attacker's Vortex Tactics. Power Surge cards can be played at any time during a player's turn except for the draw and gate phases. I'm just going to let the rulebook do the rest of the talking here because I feel it can explain things better than I can. Note the bit about reading out loud whatever effect will result from playing one of these. There is one more card type to talk about, and that is gate cards. Gate cards represent gateways between dimensions. Each gate card is linked to the same dimension as their color, and they are indirectly linked to the two adjacent dimensions. For instance, an Osiren gate is directly linked to the Osiren dimension and indirectly linked to the Chaos and Atlantean dimensions. Gate cards are combined with pyramids to create pyramid complexes. Yay, I finally get to talk about these things now! Yeah, these little pyramid counters actually do have a purpose in this game. You can have as many of these as you like during a game, but once you play a pyramid on a gate, you cannot move that pyramid to another gate for the remainder of the game. 
Any complex can send one trooper and any attached cards into a linked dimension. You can also overload a complex to send more troopers into either directly or indirectly linked dimensions by putting more pyramids onto a gate which causes the gate to eventually blow up. Once you've overloaded a complex, you cannot overload it further. Each gate starts off with one pyramid, and the rules for overloading and transporting troopers to and from dimensions are summed up in this chart on the back of the rulebook. Personally, I feel that this is one of the game's better mechanics, if only because I like pyramid-shaped objects and the wonders of ancient Egypt. Seriously though, this alone does make this game stand out from its peers. Deck building is pretty simple. You have a minimum of 50 cards in a deck with a few rules. For every 9 cards, you need a gate card. No more than 2 copies of a single card in a deck, and if you choose to have gates with special abilities, you can only have one such gate for every 2 gates without special abilities. As I mentioned earlier, you can bring as many pyramid counters as you like to the game. Okay, time to get into the game itself. Each player starts off with placing a trooper or monster from their deck in what's called the ready area, in other words, the area outside your complexes as well as creating a pyramid complex, again using a gate card from your deck. Then each player shovels their deck and draws their initial hand of 7 cards, also no more than 7 cards in your hand at the end of each turn. The player with the most operational complexes starts each turn. In case of a tie, get ready for this, the player with the most pyramids at the table, not in game, gets the tiebreaker. Better bring a thousand of them then! Each player's turn has six phases in this order, drawing, creating pyramid complexes, the sequence stage, the turn itself, saying your gates are active to your opponent to end your turn, and end of turn. During the draw phase, each player simultaneously draws a card plus one card per control dimension. You can draw up to a maximum of four cards during this phase. The next phase involves each player simultaneously creating a pyramid complex, which is optional. The sequence stage comes next, and it involves determining the active player, again the player with the most active complexes. And then comes the actual turn, which in and of itself has five phases of its own, overloading, attaching cards, transporting, combat, and the ready phase. I've already talked a bit about overloading a complex, but I want to point out the numbers on these gate cards. When you overload a complex, you're supposed to put all pyramids currently on that gate into one stack and place the stack on one of these numbers, which indicate how many turns are left before the gate goes away. The amount of pyramids you have determines where you place the stack. You can't have more than five pyramids on a gate at once. The whole point of this mechanic is to send troopers to dimensions other than either the directly or indirectly linked ones from that gate. To indicate this, you need to put the color of the dimension you want your troopers to move to on that gate. Attaching cards involves playing as many companions, vehicles, and tech cards on your troopers as you'd like. Simple as that. Transporting involves moving troopers to or from dimensions or enemy gates using your active complexes. No movement like this can happen after this phase. Speaking of after this phase, let's talk about combat now. Combat has 8 phases of its own. Phases 1 and 2 only apply if you're attacking an enemy gate, and man, I really hope you're still with me here. During the first phase, the defending player may draw up to 3 cards or until they have 7 cards in hand. Phase 2 only deals with the defending player announcing if they'll defend their gate, and then playing cards to the ready area. Phase 3 deals with the attacking player indicating which of their troopers will fight, and Phase 4 deals with the defending player indicating which of theirs will defend. Phase 5 is the point where Vortex Tactics cards can be played. I've already talked about those earlier. Phase 6 is the point where Magic cards can be played. Again, only Gaians and other troopers which have the ability can use Magic. Phase 7 is finally where damage is calculated. After adding up every single little effect, every single companion, every single tech card that has been played on these troopers, you finally get to do some damage. All you have to do is compare your trooper's modified attack number with your opponent's defense number. If it's bigger, then congratulations, you killed something today! However, the defending trooper still needs to deal its damage, and it's very likely that the battle will result in your trooper, the enemy trooper, and all those companions that were played on them dying. 
Now repeat all that for each trooper also attacking that gate or dimension until only one side has troopers in that area or until you decide to race quit because this game is complicated. Oh, by the way, there is no retreat. Hey, it says it in the rules. If the attacking player takes control of an opponent's gate, that is, they are the only force there at that moment, then the gate and any pyramid counters on it are destroyed. There are also other dimension-specific rules and bonuses. Atlantean troopers, for instance, can support a battle in an adjacent dimension, but only if they did not engage in defending the dimension they are currently in for one turn. Chaos monsters can hop dimensions without the aid of a pyramid complex. This is called dimension walking, and the only downside is that any attached cards cannot move with them in this manner and are discarded if left alone. The total number of troopers or monsters a player can have in any dimension is limited to the amount of active complexes they have. There is also the native sun bonus, which means that if a trooper is attacking or defending the dimension they came from, then they get plus three to both their attack and defense while fighting in that dimension. While this next rule isn't dimension specific, it is definitely worth noting. Yes, it is possible to deck yourself and still win. In Magic, if you are required to draw from a deck with no cards at all, you lose. Here, the rule states that the moment you draw the very last card in your deck, the player that controls the most dimensions is the winner. If there is a tie, the winner is whoever has the highest strength among cards in their ready area. That's pretty much the gist of the game as far as I understand it. On another note, this game actually has a story. We start off 12,000 years ago, where an interdimensional war was taking place between the game's six dimensions. Earth seemed to be the best place to fight because of its many interdimensional vortex gates. And then the Ice Age happened, which of course stopped the fighting. Many millennia later, ancient civilizations celebrated stories of these wars, which formed the basis for these civilizations' mythology. The Norse worshipped the Asgard, the Greeks celebrated Gaia, Celts loved talking about the Hyborians, the Egyptians loved talking about the wisdom of the Osirans, and I'm sure that if Linkara was watching this right now, he would be freaking out by this point. The story ends with this statement. Only on the darkest of nights, some genetic memory triggers, sending a shiver and a warning, they will come again. Believe it or not, there are tournament rules for this game. Pages 26 and 27 of the rulebook explain this rule set, which is, um, I don't know what to say. At least tournament rules has a mulligan clause in which a player can get rid of their hand if they're not satisfied with it, reshuffle their deck, and draw a new hand of seven. Then there are rules like this that make me say, well, that's an interesting rule. Not good, not bad, just interesting. The tiebreaker for who goes first in a game depends on how old you are, as the oldest player goes first. If the game really ends in a tie, as in the amount of strength in both players' ready areas is the same, then the game is declared a draw and must be played again. If a rules dispute comes up, the decision of the referee is final. Yes, this game's tournament rules makes frequent mention to referees. What is this, a football game? But anyways, the decision of the referee is final, taking precedence over what's written on the card and or rulebook. The referee must then write their ruling down somewhere, give it to the player who wins that match, who then keeps this ruling for the rest of the tournament. Also, ownership of pyramid counters can change during tournaments. In a tournament, if an attacking player successfully destroys an opponent's gate, then every pyramid counter on that gate becomes property of the attacking player. I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I would be pissed. I like my pyramid counters, thank you very much. I don't think it's a big surprise that this game disappeared not long after it was released. The confusing rules seem to be the nail in the coffin for this one, and I have to point out that other, more successful games like Magic and, yes, Galactic Empires were laughing at this. After saying all I've said so far here, though, I have to admit, something good is trying to happen here. A good chunk of this script was me getting ready to rip heads away, but after having a go at this and getting a good idea of how the game works, I'll admit I had to heavily edit this script to erase most of my negativity. It's not perfect, being a bit scattered thematically and not easy to pick up and play if you've never played before. The rules are a bit complicated, but you might be able to get used to them after a few goes. 
Some of the mechanics, such as the pyramid complexes and the dimension hopping, are actually pretty unique and cool. I probably could have done a lot better at trying to explain the rules, but whilst making this, I came across another video which explains the rules to Hyborian Gates better than I, or the official rulebook, could. I would really recommend watching that if you are interested in checking this game out. I would throw up an annotation, but then I remembered that YouTube decided to ditch what I considered a very useful feature, so the link to that will be in the description. Personally, I'd say that the game is hit or miss on play quality, but I can see a lot of potential here with Hyborian Gates. Getting a hold of a good number of cards is very easy. Booster boxes and starter kits are available for very cheap prices on eBay, so if you're interested in playing this or just interested in the Vallejo and Bell artwork in CCG form, I'd say go right ahead, take a peek at that video I mentioned earlier, and you might have some fun with this game. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'm really glad to see that people are liking my dead CCG videos. Of all the videos I do for this channel, these take the most effort, and I think it shows. I'll definitely try to do more dead CCG videos in the future. Until then, I hope to see you again.